All right, so welcome to this criminal law capsule, which is covering the subject of intoxication. And in this particular capsule, I'm really going to focus on the way in which intoxication affects a person's criminal liability. And I'm not going to get into many of the interesting debates about social policy and whether it's a good idea to do things the way we do. I'm just going to try and break down the complexity of the rules governing intoxication, because they are fairly complex. So I've tried to diagram uh, a variety of questions you need to consider in assessing how intoxication might your, uh, affect a particular case. So let's jump right into it. Okay, so intoxication and liability for criminal offending. It seems to me that uh, no matter how you wish to approach it, the first question is always got to be how did the accused become intoxicated? And the reason for that is that the rules are so different where the accused becomes intoxicated involuntarily. In a nutshell, the law doesn't wish to make people liable for things that they do when they could not have even avoided becoming intoxicated in the first place. And as you'll see going forward, the law really creates a series of compromises in situations where a person becomes intoxicated and causes various harms. And the reason for that is because, on one hand, we believe in the idea that you should not be guilty if you did not intend to commit a particular harm, but on the other hand, we have to hold people accountable for what they do when they're drunk. If people get off because they're drunk, there's a real concern about the extent to which um, criminal justice is actually being served. You know, that, that's the real concern here. However, that concern does not come into play where the accused becomes intoxicated involuntarily, and the law has always separated these two types of intoxication. So let's look at involuntarily. And the first thing to recognize is what we mean by the word involuntary intoxication. It is a very limited concept, quite correctly. We make it limited because we only wish to exculpate people where they really didn't choose to become intoxicated. Three situations can raise involuntary intoxication. First is the substance is taken against your will. That's very easy. If you are drugged, if someone spikes your drink, if somebody does something to you and injects you or forces you to take something, what happens next is much less of a concern. Okay, So we are at that point willing to accept that it was involuntary intoxication. The second is more controversial. This is the situation in which you didn't know that you ingested the substance at all. So again, you're going to see that some of these factual scenarios can get a little bit complex, but again, the case law is generally clear that if you didn't know you ingested a substance at all, so again, I was taking, I grabbed something and I, I, I drank it and I wasn't trying to drink it, um, that is a situation in which I just didn't know that the substance was in there and therefore uh, it was involuntary intoxication. And the third is a little bit more controversial also. It's again, it's where the situation is where you had no idea that the, the, the substance that you ingested had any intoxicated properties. So in theory, if I was, you know, somebody told me they were making uh, mock margaritas and I start drinking these mock margaritas and I know what I'm ingesting, so I'm not in category B and it's not against my will, but I really had no idea whatsoever of any intoxicating properties, in this situation, I am involuntarily intoxicated. And already, if you're listening to these, this can get into some pretty complex subject matter. But let me first get rid of the situations that are clearly not involuntary intoxication. And that is a situation where, oh my god, I didn't know it would be that strong. The courts have been pretty harsh on any claim that you didn't get intoxicated because you didn't know how strong what it was you were drinking. Essentially, that's why you'll notice I listed you didn't know that it had any intoxicating potential. The fact that you misjudged what the intoxicating potential was does not mean you were involuntarily intoxicated. And similarly, you got a different drug than I asked for. That's where this happens a lot on the, you know, intoxication includes uh, drug impairment. And essentially you have drug addicts or people who consume drugs effectively saying, well, I thought I was getting drug A, ecstasy, and in reality I was getting LSD and that caused me to flip out in a particular way. Um, that's not involuntary intoxication. Generally speaking, you will be penalized or I shouldn't say penalized, you will be treated as being voluntarily intoxicated in any of these situations. Okay, so what does it mean? Important to keep in mind, let's just start with where we are. If your intoxication is involuntary, 
That means you go down a completely different line. Everything that I'm about to tell you about voluntary intoxication is irrelevant because the law accepts that if you are involuntarily intoxicated, you can raise your intoxication for any offense. And that is really important to keep in mind. doesn't matter. We're going to talk in a little bit about the way in which offenses are divided for uh, voluntary intoxication. does not apply here. Intoxication can negate either the mens rea or the actus reus. You usually don't have to go to the actus reus so long as you can show that you can negate a mens rea element. But it's useful for actus reus too because the truth is uh, if you can show that your, your conduct was involuntary because of intoxication, you may be able to get off of offenses that don't even have uh, a mens rea or a subjective mens rea component. So intoxication that's involuntary can be very powerful. Where the evidence is available, again, the burden of proof is on the Crown. So the Crown, as long as you can show that you might have been involuntarily intoxicated, the Crown has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you weren't or that it didn't affect the actus reus and mens rea. And that's a really important point here. And this is something that's going to continue to be raised as we go through every type of intoxication. Remember this. Intoxication is not a defense. Intoxication means that you can raise the fact that you were intoxicated to show that you might not have had the mental element required. Thus, where you are involuntarily intoxicated, you'll see in just a moment that assault is what's called a general intent offense, and you can not raise intoxication uh, as, a, as a, a means of showing you didn't intend to apply force to somebody. But that's not true with involuntary intoxication. I can show that I didn't intend to hit anybody because I was on some drug that made me lose basic comprehension of where I was. That is a good defense. It's not a defense. It's showing you didn't have the mens rea. But you are allowed to raise intoxication where it occurs involuntarily. But let me be clear. The fact that you were intoxicated is not a defense in and of itself. So if I'm intoxicated and I continue to act as I feel like it, it doesn't matter whether it's involuntary or not. The only question is, do I possess the required mental and physical elements of the offense? If the intoxication just made me, I don't know, let's say I, I, I take a particular drug that makes me really reckless, so I decide to go out and start a fight with somebody. The fact that I'm really reckless doesn't matter. The only question is, did I intend to commit the, the mental elements and physical elements of the offense? So therefore, what you're left with is what I just said to you. If there is reasonable doubt about an element of the offense because of your involuntary intoxication, you're entitled to an acquittal. If there is no reasonable doubt about the element of the offense, you are still convicted despite the fact that you were involuntarily intoxicated. With one caveat. Here it is. It might be possible to raise involuntary intoxication as a defense. There's a lot of uh, uh, legal writing about this, a lot of scholarship, but very few cases that say even where the actus reus and mens rea are present, you might have a good defense because excuses are about whether or not you acted in a morally voluntary fashion and whether or not you should be held liable for what you did. Some have argued that if I get, let's say I get drugged in a way that causes me to act recklessly, the example I gave you earlier, I have the mens rea, I punch somebody in the face because I've taken a drug that makes me violent or reckless. There's an argument that I should have an excuse for this. I've committed the mens rea, I've committed the actus reus, but there's an argument that I should have an excuse. And the reason is because I'm not... I shouldn't be held culpable for something that I, I really could not have avoided doing because I was involuntarily intoxicated. So I don't know if that's going to happen, but sort of good to keep in mind as a possibility. Okay. The other reason I like to start with involuntary intoxication is because it's really so rare. If you think about it, situations A, B, and C that I've listed over here are not going to happen very often. Most intoxication in our society is quite voluntary. So how do we deal with it? We move to step two. And I think that step two is sort of um, what I like to look at as the evidentiary burden. Essentially, what we do is the courts have imposed a sort of, you know, a checkpoint where we say, okay, well, you were intoxicated. What it means by intoxicated is there's some evidence of intoxication. There's evidence that the accused might have drunk a couple of beers to start with. So generally speaking, the courts set up a, a, a checkpoint here. And what that checkpoint is, is, well, okay, no, there was evidence that you drank, but you weren't intoxicated. 
So it makes no difference to liability whatsoever if, as I said in my discussion of involuntary intoxication, you're drunk so you're more likely to commit offenses, and most people are. There is a very strong correlation between getting intoxicated and committing crimes. So the fact that you were drunk and that made you more likely to commit the offense doesn't matter. I get more angry when I'm drunk. Who cares? I only fight when I'm drunk. Who cares? Nobody cares. The fact that you have some intoxication and that makes you more likely to commit the offense doesn't make a difference one way or another. And the courts have also said that if the intoxication is really minimal and there's just not enough that anyone could think, well, you were so drunk you couldn't have intended that, no need to consider it at all. Just take it out of the equation. And by and large, that statement of the law is correct. There are some caveats where you combine intoxication with various other things that might have caused you to lack a mental state, but again, a little bit beyond the scope of this particular podcast. All right, so no, great then intoxication is irrelevant. So that's what we're left with. If the intoxication didn't make a difference, don't consider it. So that's step two, an evidentiary threshold. But in most cases where you have intense drinking or there's evidence that there was drinking or some form of drug use, you've got enough to go down through step two, which takes us on to step three. And this is when the case law gets very complex. And if you want to go read all the cases on the distinction between specific and general intent, be my guest. Very complex area, very controversial area, in my opinion, a very weak legal distinction. But nonetheless, it is one that has been chosen in our society. And effectively, what the courts have done is split all the offenses in the criminal code and elsewhere into two categories. Ones that are of specific intent, ones that are of general intent. If the offense is of general intent, we move on to step four. But first we have to decide, well, is it specific or general? So how do we do that? Well, with some difficulty, but I'll run through the basics with you. Specific intent offenses are generally ones that are said to have an additional purpose or ulterior element. That should read element, not offense. So there is an additional purpose or ulterior motive. Offenses of general intent are meant to be extremely simplistic. So assault, one of the most common, is an offense of general intent. And the reason for that is because assault is simply, I punch you, I intend to apply force. A very simple action. Offenses with additional purpose or ulterior elements are designed to be more, are designed to reflect a higher form of mental cognition. And for that reason, we allow drunkenness to be considered. Well, I, I did tell you that some of the logic here was a bit weak, but anyway, I've said I'm not going to get into that. So let's just distinguish between assault, which is the intention to apply force, and assault for the purpose of uh, resisting arrest. That is a specific intent offense. And the reason is that you're not just assaulting, committing the basic intent element of hitting somebody. You're doing it for a reason. And the basic idea is that your intoxication can be raised to show that you lacked the specific intent of the particular offense. Murder. Murder is like assault. You commit an act of applying force of some kind, but you have to do so with the intention to kill. And that is designed, that is said to be the superior uh, uh, mental element that can be negated if you can show you were drunk enough. Theft is another one. You commit an act with an intent to deprive. So the basic act is I go up and pick somebody's wallet up off the table. But it's only an offense if I have an intention to deprive them of that element, of that wallet. And drunkenness can be raised to say, no, 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 I was just absent-minded. Yes, I know I picked it up, but I didn't really know what I was doing. Drunkenness is good for that. Usually with specific intent offenses, there's a policy component. The fact that drunkenness does not acquit you entirely. Though that's not the case with theft, where drunkenness does acquit you entirely. There is an included offense. So murder does not mean you're innocent if you were drunk. You can still be convicted of manslaughter. One of the reasons why assault and sexual assault are both general intent offenses, because there is nothing else you can be convicted of if you're not convicted of the main offense. And the Tatton case is a very recent case of the Supreme Court of Canada that simultaneously clears up the general specific intent distinction and also sort of shows how, you know, 
logically bankrupt the distinction is because it's it's it, it sometimes works in the idea that there is a complex thought and reasoning process in the way that I've showed you but the court has recognized that this is a bit of a, uh, a shell game and they've said you know well we'll look to the social policy you know this is a crime that occurs a lot when people are drunk so therefore you can't raise drunkenness again I'm not here to criticize the the bankruptcy of this particular designation I'm just here to tell you that's what it is so the court has said is there a complex thought reasoning process and is there an included offense can we still punish them for something so that is in a nutshell the way in which we define specific intent now what does it mean well, if we have specific intent, offense, does that mean being intoxicated leads to an acquittal? Not at all. It just means that intoxication can be raised. Okay, so in other words, intoxication is relevant. And you can raise it to show the absence of the specific intent, which again, does not, that's why you can be still convicted of the included intent offense. Manslaughter is an included, is a general intent crime. Murder is a specific intent crime. The intoxication can only be raised to show that you didn't intend to kill. It cannot be raised to show you didn't intend to touch the person altogether because that is a general intent crime. Crazy? Again, that's the way the law works. All right, so that's why that designation is so important as a sort of way to split up the two types of offenses. What happens where, we know now, what happens where you have an offense of specific intent if your drunkenness is severe enough and it shows that it impeded uh, the intent in question, you'll be entitled to an acquittal for that offense. But what if the offense is one of general intent? That's where we get into the area of extreme intoxication. Extreme intoxication came to the forefront in the Supreme Court of Canada case in Davio. Until 1994, there was no step four. didn't exist. But after 1994, the Supreme Court decided in the Davio case that extreme intoxication that amounts to involuntariness is a defense. Unfortunately, that was followed by, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, Section 33.1 of the code, which makes this whole thing a little bit more complex, as you can see from this complex diagram. So let's go through how this actually works. Obviously, if the answer is no, you're a general intent offense, so you've gotten through to step four, but uh, the answer is no, then intoxication is irrelevant to liability. It can only be raised in sentencing, and that's an important thing to keep in mind. The fact that your intoxication didn't make you, uh, doesn't get you an acquittal for the offense, doesn't mean it has nothing to do with the proceeding. Drunkenness can be a mitigating factor in sentencing in some cases because it can show that you know even if the law says you can't raise it to show you didn't intend to commit the offense, the law also says that your culpability in sentencing is a measure in part of how much you desired the consequences that actually occurred. Let's say the answer is yes. And even there, just saying that the answer is yes requires us to look at a fair bit of case law that examines what it means to be extremely intoxicated. So first of all, we're not talking any ordinary intoxication. We're talking in a state that's akin to automatism or insanity. In other words, you are so intoxicated, the ordinary person would die. You cannot even, you know, comport yourself in a manner you have no control over your functioning body. Let's just say it's a pretty hard state to reach. In fact, some cases recently have said, despite Supreme Court of Canada precedent, there's good scientific reason to believe you can't get to the state by alcohol alone, although it seems to be accepted that certain drugs can get you there, or a combination of drug and alcohol abuse. So it's theoretically possible, very hard to reach, and the burden to prove that you actually did it lies on you, lies on the accused who's trying to raise the defense. So very hard to get into this defense. And it gets harder. Section 33.1 has expressly excluded any offenses that interfere with the bodily integrity of another person. So any offenses involving threats or harm to another person are out. Essentially, no. Uh, yes, if it did threaten to interfere or actually interfere with another person, you are out. You are guilty unless Section 33.1 is unconstitutional. Now, the weight of authority says that it is constitutional, and if that authority is accepted ultimately, then once again, intoxication is irrelevant to liability.
on the contrast, if the answer is no, and a court finds that it's unconstitutional, we revert to Davio, which says that extreme intoxication is a defense to any general intent offending. And therefore, you would be entitled to an acquittal on that basis. Very complex little package, but that's what we are left with. And there's just one little thing that I want to get to, uh, just as a little talking point that sort of interests me. This arises very, very infrequently. And notice that we're all the way through step four. And that means we have a general intent offense for which the person is not acting in a state of extreme intoxication. So the person is pretty darn drunk, but they're not acting out automatically. And I've said to you that intoxication is irrelevant to liability. And that's true. But I want to just point out one little, little aspect of this that's interesting. And it's interesting because what we're left with is this idea that intoxication is irrelevant. But what exactly do you do in a case where the intoxication seems pretty darn relevant? You have a guy who's really drunk and he commits an assault because he's flailing around in some state of drunkenness and really has no intention to apply force to anybody but strictly because he's drunk. The basic position is you do not consider intoxication at all. And I think that position is good law. Here's the caveat. And I don't think it's a caveat, but it's just a way of looking at this offending that really, I think, accords with the basic principles underlying specific and general intent offenses. So the fact that the accused was too intoxicated to know about a particular fact or consequence is irrelevant to guilt. That's clear from the jurisprudence. However, what about a situation where the reasonable person would not have known either? Again, there's a quite a bit of uh, legal writing out there that suggests that in this situation, you know, like this one, the extremely drunk accused touches the, a woman thinking it was his wife. Now remember that Section 33.1 has excluded sexual assault from this. Um, it, you know, he might not even be extremely intoxication. Intoxication is irrelevant, and the jury will be told, don't consider intoxication. However, what if a reasonable person would have made the same mistake in the circumstances? There's good reason to believe that in this circumstance, you can't punish the accused just because he's drunk. And that's what you'd be doing. You'd be saying, well, he didn't intend to touch this woman without consent, and a reasonable person wouldn't have done so either. Essentially, you are punishing this person just because they're drunk and taking away the mental element that would have applied to any other person. Um, I don't know how this would ever work out if it ever went to a court case, but my guess is there's good reason to apply some sort of reasonable person standard to at least protect the accused who didn't act any differently than any other person, notwithstanding having been drunk. So as you can see, a lot of steps to take care of here. You've got to go through and consider whether the accused was voluntarily intoxicated, whether or not the intoxication was in some way significant, whether or not the offense was one of specific intent, and of course whether or not Section 33.1 negates the ability to rely on extreme intoxication. I hope this is of some use to you in trying to sort out how intoxication matters in an individual case. In any event, if you have any questions, let me know, and have a great day.